March is almost here, and what happens as we move into March can tell us a lot about what happens for the rest of the year. So today, we are going to be talking about the stats that we need to be watching, along with the price upgrades we're getting from big trading houses. UBS believe the S&P 500 is now headed to 5400. Will they be right or will they be wrong? But more importantly, what does that mean for the current rally in markets? Small rejections were made after making new all-time highs in the S&P 500 and the Qs, and with a weekly close at all-time highs, things couldn't look any more bullish. So in today's video, we're going to answer the question, buy now, wait, or sell the S&P 500. Welcome everybody to the Daily Recap Show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video guys, and if you watch until the end, I got a couple of trade ideas for you. Let's get into it. Looking at the daily heat map, despite what you may see in the indices, actually a very bullish day through and through. We saw standout performance in the majority of sectors, except for tech and comm services. They really did lag behind. Semiconductors 2 except NVIDIA, the magical asset continues to outperform but we saw very green price action across the board defensives healthcare industrials real estate utilities materials financials as well energy didn't do so well as well as tesla but a very green day across the board especially if you look under the hood now let's hop on the charts now looking at what indices did on the day it was actually a pretty flat day across the board look at the s p 500 up ever so slightly the nasdaq was down due to the weakness in tech by 0.37 percent mid caps and small caps were up ever so slightly and we actually have a look at the rsp up 0.27 percent so the broader market did gain but it wasn't anything substantial that being said yesterday we did put up quite the bullish day so to actually see another green day is very very bullish but diving into the daily chart right here on a more granular level you can see what we actually did was we gapped up to a new all-time high had price discovery above the 5100 area then sellers took us all the way down to this area right here and what price action looked like was sort of like an open up down and then we sort of just traded that's exactly what price action looked like and fairly muted price action considering what we did yesterday but it's going to be very hard to produce follow through in an index especially after a two percent day so to actually see a gap up is actually quite bullish when you look at it all in all the fact that we did close ever so slightly above yesterday's close is generally a bullish indicator and I do think that we're probably going to buy dip sell rips all the way into next week unless we actually break the 49.45 level we can actually eye all dip buying opportunities as far down as 49.45 looking for again price action above 5100 5150 5200 everything about this chart screams very very bullish because you've made a low year higher low higher low higher low and now put in another higher low imagine if we go down all the way to like here maybe close this gap put in a low right there and continue upward that's just continuation of the uptrend and closing the week off at a new all-time high is super super bullish have a look at the weekly chart that's incredibly bullish when you look at it but we're going to talk more about the weekly charts and the monthly charts in the week and video as well as cover all the other sectors small caps mid caps the rsp so go ahead subscribe to me below and you'll get all of that in the weekend video we're going to do an in-depth analysis looking at multi-time frame analysis for all of these charts and we do that every single week in the weekend video but just to reiterate based on this chart right here everything is looking bullish and unless we go ahead and break this 49.45 level on a daily basis, this is looking very, very bullish and very constructive for higher price action into next week, especially as we exit the window of weakness Tuesday, Wednesday. So the end of February is drawing to a close. We're about a week away from the turn of the new month. So I'm going to show you guys some stats. What normally happens after we have a December to February quarter that's greater than two and a half percent accompanied by an all time high in February. And it does look like we are going to meet these parameters these are the returns we can expect from 1st of march up until the end of february the next year we have 16 wins one loss average return in that 12 month period 15.7 percent the only year we lost negative 5.8 percent in 1987 and that was because of a horrid october and a horrid november and we do know that black monday happened in this period right here a disastrous almost 26 percent drop in the dow jones and that led to the year been just negative at 5.8 percent every other year was positive and the march to may quarter still sits at a perfect record 17 wins zero losses average return 5.09 percent and momentum brings momentum what's so special about this performance factor right here is that the drawdown 1987 we had a negative 21.2 percent drawdown max drawdown but every other year we never saw 
greater than negative 10%, which means that when we get 4 to 5% dip buying opportunities, history tells us to buy the dip and wait for exceptional returns in excess of 15%. Now let's talk about fund managers. Today we're going to talk about MAG7 and what fund managers are holding, but we first have to understand what do their portfolios look right now. And the NAM exposure number or the NAM index tells us that. All this tells us is that 74.7% of fund managers have allocated their portfolio to US equities. Now that's a very high number and this only accounts for US fund managers. So it's clear that US fund managers like US stock. Now let's actually talk about mutual funds and what they hold in the Magnificent Seven because these are the market movers in the market right now. They have generated a large amount of the returns. So it's good to know what they are doing inside the portfolio of the largest funds. And you can see that in general, large cap mutual funds are 672 basis points underweight the Magnificent Seven. So that's 6.72% against the benchmark. And the benchmark they use is the S&P 500. Now these stocks right here, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Meta, Nvidia, Tesla, these stocks have produced the vast majority of returns throughout 2024 as well as 2023. And as a result, fund managers are underweight and that's why they've actually underperformed the S&P 500 by a large mark. 46% of large cap mutual funds have outperformed their benchmarks here today, which means 54% have actually underperformed, which is quite significant. So if you just go ahead, put your money in the S&P 500, you will outperform high half of fund managers getting paid obscene fees to under allocate to the Magnificent Seven. And the reason why they're underperforming the index has to do with the fact that they're just under allocated to these stocks. The MAG7 returned 89% in 2023, the S&P 500 32%, the S&P 493 18%, and fund managers are sort of like allocated in the middle right here. And that's why they've underperformed the S&P 500 and significantly underperformed the MAG7. And the truth is they can't actually allocate a large part of their fund to the MAG7 because they have all these benchmarks and regulatory requirements that they have to follow and they simply can't just put like the bulk of their money into these stocks right here. And that's where you as a retail investor have an advantage because you can go out and just own these seven stocks or the mega cap 100 or the mega cap 50. That is your advantage against these massive fund managers collecting obscene fees. Now looking at cash allocation, mutual funds have slashed their allocation to cash this year. Now this is data from 2023. We could see that cash as a percentage of total assets has fallen significantly throughout 2023, much because stocks have rallied. That being said, if we actually have a look at it on a cash and liquid asset basis, it has actually fallen as well to 174 billion. Now the reason why funds have actually slashed their allocation to cash has to actually do with earnings growth. We could see that the Magnificent Seven from Jan 1st, 2022 up until the 21st of Feb 2024, the majority of returns have actually come from earnings growth, where multiple growth for every single one of these asset classes has been negative. Now let's have a look right here. Nvidia, 230% increase in earnings, negative 100% multiple growth. In other words, Nvidia is getting cheaper because earnings is exceeding price growth and the net returns is 130% in that period. We can see here that the only stock, Tesla, has had negative multiple growth, 8% earnings growth, and that's resulted in a negative 45% return in the last two and a half years. But every other stock, including the S&P 500, has seen positive earnings growth, negative multiple growth. In other words, the rally that we're seeing across the board is actually an earnings driven rally, not a multiple driven rally. And that is a hallmark of a very strong rally. An earnings driven rally is far superior to a multiple driven rally because if we have a multiple driven rally, the earnings need to meet that price. If it doesn't meet that price, stocks fall severely. The fact that we're getting the earnings, stocks are rallying, yet getting cheaper on an earnings basis, that is the hallmark of a very strong rally. And it's why we're probably going to continue and see a multiple expansion phase probably towards the end of this year. So we're probably going to keep rallying on earnings throughout 2024 and then a multiple expansion phase at the end of 2024, 2025.
Now, let's actually have a look at some of the earnings of these Mag 7. So Tesla down 45% from its peak. Why? You can actually see that free cash flow per share is actually coming down from its peak. When free cash flow was negative, the stock did nothing. The second it got positive, the stock rallied. Now that it's dropping, same thing is happening here with Tesla. And this has a lot to do with margins, price cuts. I really hope Elon gets this fixed because this is a great stock and I really do like Elon Musk. Looking at Google. Now, Google has actually underperformed the Mag 7 this year. I believe it's only up about 3%, whereas the MAG7 is up 10% plus, NVIDIA 30%. The reason being is that earnings growth right here, free cash flow per share actually fell from its highs and that's why Google hasn't done anything. Meta, an all-time high in free cash flow, all-time high stock prices nearly every week. Same thing with Microsoft, all-time high free cash flow per share, all-time high stock. Apple, still producing a ton of free cash flow, but not quite at its highs. And this is why we've sort of been building out this range here in Apple. Some would say a bull flag, but it really depends on what earnings are going to do over the next couple of years. That being said, Apple do have quite a few growth ventures in the pipeline. We're talking about the Vision Pro, their self-driving car, AI, and a bunch of other things that could really help spur growth. But when you're making 400, 500, 600 billion dollars in revenue per year, it's just really hard to grow because you've saturated the global market. You truly have become what capitalists dream of. Now looking at Nvidia, and you can see all-time high free cash cash flow in their latest earnings report, all time high stock. And we can see that earnings is backing up the price we're currently seeing. Now let's actually continue talking about Nvidia and some of the price targets we've seen because it has actually been unreal. Out of every single analyst, UBS cut their price target from 800 to 850. Key Bank has it at 1,100. I've seen some absurd price targets of 1,400 from very reputable sources. But out of all of these big names, we get an average price target of about $820. We do get some some low as 620 up from 410, some high 880, 900, 795, 925. But people are very, very bullish on Nvidia and likely so. It's producing the earnings. It's in a key market. It's the leader. It has a wide moat and it's the number one AI play right now. Now on the topic of earnings, this is S&P 500 earnings. And this is the latest data as of February 22nd. We get these every three to four days and I like showing it to you guys. Now here are the key points and this is absolutely crucial guys we're officially at double digit growth inclusive of all sectors excluding energy the index growth is at 13.6% 437 out of 500 companies have reported 75% have beat expectations and revenue growth is at 3.4% excluding energy we're looking at 4.9% so 2023 Q4 earnings have been absolutely stellar double digit growth is really all you can ask as an investor especially in an index. And actually earnings are expected to be roughly the same in all the other quarters, except for Q4, where the 493 is expected to report 21% earnings growth. So guys, we could see a huge earnings driven rally in 2024. Let's just hope the macro holds up and that corporate earnings can keep producing such stellar results. That being said, in the year and now, earnings are great. Now, Nvidia got quite a bunch of upgrades. So too did the S&P 500. UBS right here have been flip-flopping like a politician in election year and they just raised their price target to 5400 They were at 4850 by year end 2024. In January, they went to 4150 Now they're at 5400 for the S&P 500. And this is largely driven by demand, which is positive for stocks. Returns and profits are measured in nominal dollars. Put differently, higher inflation tends to be positive for stock prices. While the market sold off on a more robust CPI and PPI reports last week, our work indicate that these demand-driven readings are constructive for future returns. They also cite that consumer confidence has risen three months in a row. Payrolls are up. ISM manufacturing, we've covered this at length. The manufacturing recession. Economic surprise. Vertical move higher in surprises since mid-January. Q1 24 GDP now at 2.9% thanks to GDP now. And consensus forecast for 2024 GDP 1.6% versus 1.3. And they increased a target to 5400 as a result. This represents 7.9% upside. And the 2024 for EPS at 240, 2025 EPS at 2025, and they moved healthcare from overweight to neutral, and their overweight 
financials from a neutral perspective. UBS prefers cyclicals over defensives due to the continued economic strength, M&A and easing lending standards. For those of you that are new to my channel, I gave you my index price target on the 1st of January at 53.84. You can actually go watch the video when I did that. So I was ahead of the game, guys. I was way ahead of the game. But I digress. This just further helps the bull side that we probably are going to get higher returns in the S&P 500 and all dips should be buying opportunities for higher price action at 5,000 plus. Now looking at seasonality, we have completely diverged from trend. We're up about 5% for the week here in the S&P 500. I'm actually running out of space in my chart. Normally we do expect a negative February in the last two weeks, but with the strength we've seen in the market and with Nvidia's earnings, we caught a bit here and kept rallying. What does that mean? It probably means we go higher. Maybe we do kind of just trend in this area for the first couple of days in the window of weakness next week, but then come Wednesday, Thursday, we probably should move higher, especially as the call gamma strike moves higher up the tape. Now looking at gamma, what can we expect? There's been a, a few changes. 49.65 is now the gamma flip zone. And something to note, over the last three or four weeks, the gamma flip zone has normally been the low of the week prior. So looking into next week, 49.65 or anywhere from 49.45 to 49.50, which was this week's low, might actually prove as a good dip buying opportunity for next week if we do get there. But all in all, the call gamma resistance continues to be 5,100. It's a very big strike, more than $2 billion in jacks, as you can see right there. And essentially what this number tells us is how much market makers need to hedge for every 1% move in the S&P 500. If this does move to the 5200 strike, expect us to go there. But as it stands right now, I do expect price discovery around this 5100 area, especially leading into the March OPEX. This might change into the window of weakness. There's a lot of gamma already in the tape. This might even be three or four billion dollars by the time the March OPEX comes around. But what we really want to see is movement to the 5200 strike. It is the second biggest strike on this tape and something to note there are no bears negative gamma is fallen substantially especially as positive gamma has entered the tape what does this mean participants are still bullish or in positive gamma so buy dips sell rips that's exactly what i've been telling you guys for the last four months and if you have done that you've made a lot of money there's no reason to short unless we get a weekly close below the gamma flip zone and actually have sustained price discovery below these levels so we're going to look at a bunch of consumer stocks mostly in the discretionary space just to see how the consumer is holding up relative to these names now i do think it's not the best parameter for the consumer but i think middle class and above it'll tell us how the middle class consumer is looking. And we could see stuff like Hermes absolutely rallying all time highs here and an absolute huge bit up in the stock up 1.37%. And like this chart tells us, you know, lows, higher lows, making highs, higher highs, tells us it's probably just going to continue higher. And in any pullback should be bought to towards higher price action. Elf Beauty in the US. Are consumers buying makeup? Yes, they are up 1.96%. And the last two quarters, we actually had an earnings beat, an earnings beat right here. And again, same thing, all dips should be bought the middle class consumer looking very very strong look at it lvmh this is a weekly chart we can see that it's not quite at its highs but we definitely are rallying the reason why it's not quite at its highs right here is because lvmh have a ton of chinese consumers which is affecting their overall revenue but the international segment excluding china is looking very very healthy very similar situation here for christian dior the revenue situation they have a lot of chinese consumers but excluding that the revenue situation internationally in europe is looking really good and they're actually a couple of percentage points away from all-time highs and they might actually go get that in 2024 especially if china does come out of that recession now looking at ferrari something that's not dependent on china race is the ticker new all-time highs up 6.9 percent you know you buy dips on this chart we dipped it here you buy those dips into ferrari and the high-end consumer is looking very very healthy now looking at costco just a parameter for the consumer in general really really healthy chart and what all of these charts are telling us is that excluding china the consumer is in a relative relatively healthy positioning. And what stocks also do is look ahead and they do think that the consumer is probably going to improve. And that's why we're seeing stocks like Race, Elf Beauty, you know, at all time highs because the consumer is holding in there and expected to improve throughout 2024. Now let's have a look at some credit risk profiles. This is the BAA corporate bond versus the US Treasury yield, the spread between the two. Now when there's major risk coming into the market, you can see here in 2022, these normally spike up. This right here was the SVB bank crisis. We saw a spike up. 
Credit spreads are at historical low levels here between the BAA corporate bond versus the US Treasury. And this is telling us that everything in the economy is looking really, really good. It's the exact same thing for the AA corporate bond. There's just no risk in the economy that the market is seeing. And we saw a decline, a sustained decline through most of 2023 and now even into 2024. And again, if we see credit spreads widen, that's when we can get worried. But for now, it's just not the case. Now, looking at the yield curve, a lot of people quote this saying, you know, an inverted yield curve is an indicator for recession and you're right you know looking at the 10 year minus the three month it's still in deeply negative territory and what will need to happen for this to uninvert right now is that the 10 year yield would need to rally but what really needs to happen is the fed needs to cut rates to normalize policy the three month is dependent on the federal funds rate and what that looks like so if the fed cuts rates this is going to go higher or the 10 year will need to rally if the fed keeps holding off on cutting rates the 10 year eventually will rally and we will and the yield curve will normalize but for now the market is pricing in rate cuts in the middle towards the end of 2024. We can actually see here the 10 year minus the two year spread, not quite as inverted, but again, the exact same situation. The 10 year will need to rally significantly for us to get out of this inverted yield curve situation, or the Fed will just need to cut rates, and that's going to affect the two year more greatly than the 10 year. Now, yield curves are normally a good indicator of an incoming recession. You could see here in 2001, 2007, it gave us an indicator beforehand. Now, the recession normally actually only comes after the yield curve uninverts is that going to happen it might right here but there's so much government spending and the economy is looking really really good in comparison to what the economy looked like in 2001 2007 but what history tells us that an inverted in yield curve is a leading indicator for a recession and we should take it as such all right now to answer the question do we buy now wait or do we sell the S&P 500? And do I think the market is going to crash? I think right now the S&P 500 is a buy based on everything I've shown you in this video. All of the data points to higher price action. We can definitely get a pullback of seven to 10%, that's 100% on the table. But all the signs, all the data is pointing to the S&P 500 going higher. So for me, the S&P 500 is a buy. But if you've made it up until year, thank you so much for watching, guys. If you like this video, please subscribe, leave a like, comment on the video, and hit that notification bell. It really helps me with the algorithm. Cheers.